What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Steve. I'm Lindsay. Today we are super excited to finally be checking out something that has been recommended to us many, many times yeah. in the comment section, and that is Know Your Ally Britain. This is a wartime film. I believe it was created in 1944 by the American War Department. I think this will be very interesting, not just because of the World War II component, but also to give us a glimpse into what life was like right. in, in the UK back then. Yeah, in World War II Britain, basically. What was life like back in the 40s in Britain? Yeah. You know, what has changed since then? Um, this will really be the first time that not only I, but also Lindsay have looked into any type of anything like this. Because this is a much longer video than we normally mm -hmm. do, we are planning on breaking this up into two parts. Yeah. And so, um, just be a little more enjoyable to film and to watch. Yeah, after. I guess that's it for us. Yeah. You ready to get started? Let's do it. All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and check out Know Your Ally Britain. Oh, is this rugby? Is it? I'm yeah. trying to, I'm trying to see the ball. I can't tell. That game wasn't won by the man who made that touchdown. It was won by a team. And every man on the team no, I think that's the ball. Um. winning it. <laughs> We're playing another kind of a game now. Only this one isn't for fun. It's for keeps. And this game won't be won by any single player either. It'll be won by a team. A team called the United Nations. The ball will be carried by the men in the backfield. The tough little guy from China. Big Joe Russia, John Britton, and a guy called Yank, the four greatest backs <laughs> in the world. So let's take a look at the men who carry the ball with us. You know something that I always think about when I see anything from, say, World War II? Mm -hmm. It's just how young the soldiers you're looking at are. I mean, I a lot of them are like 18 years old. Yeah, it's easy to, like, because it looks older, they seem mm, older. Right. But yeah, you're right. You're, you're just thinking these are these are kids. I, I mean, not everybody, obviously, but right. a whole lot of them are kids. Who are they? How do they live? What makes them tick? Let's start with the one that's toughest to understand. The one we know just enough about to confuse us. John <laughs> Britton. Here's where he lives. A little island no larger than the state of Idaho. Okay, this, what? Oh, this wow. This is the first time I've ever seen landmass size comparison. Yeah. No. Okay, I knew that it was smaller than Texas, but I didn't know it was smaller than Idaho. No. Wow. So that includes Scotland, Wales, and, and England. England? Yeah. Uh, wow. What? You know, that just goes to show you when you think of how many people are live in Great Britain. And I can't remember... The exact number is it 60 million or something so when you think about 60 oh, million people living in idaho oh that would that would be very um what's the word i'm looking for very um very close net uh, yeah like, density no uh, wonder no wonder you guys feel like a big family because it's literally like a state yeah that's that true is, oh my gosh that blows but my mind it does look like it's bigger than idaho yeah, maybe a little. Yeah, but I'm but, just well, like, I guess about the same size, roughly. Wow. Wow. Oh my gosh. I, I honestly that I envy that a little bit because you guys are just closer in every sense of the word. That's like, true. And it would just as a country, like I can see why you can get things done more easily. Yeah. And band together more easily because you're all right there together for the most part. I mean, it also goes show why uh, public transportation would work mm -hmm. so well there compared yeah. to here. Yeah. That blows my mind. Yeah. That's really cool. Half a million people live in Idaho. 96 times that many live in Britain. Man. And the Nazis and the Japs yeah. think about Lebensraum, living space. But there are more people on a square mile of Britain than a square mile of Germany or Italy or Japan. 
More congestion than practically any place on earth except the New York subway. What? Or a sardine can. Are you That's serious? That explains a lot about John Britton. We build front porches on our houses because we didn't want to miss the chance to see our neighbors. But John Britton hides himself in a little box <laughs> and plants a hedge around that to make sure he doesn't. Oh, that, that makes sense. I love it because, like, that's me. I want the privacy. <laughs> yeah. I want to be closed off my porches yeah. in the back. I don't. <laughs> I've never even thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense yeah. when you are so tight in a, such a tight space with mm -hmm. other people, it would I make you want to hide away a little bit. Densely. I knew it was more densely populated than here, obviously, based off the but space I figured and whatnot. that was but... mostly just London or like the really big city. Right. No, I knew it was much more densely populated than here, but I, I really never put it in that type of perspective. Wow. Yeah, that's... Okay, that's... we can't keep pausing. Yeah, that's... It's yeah. going to take forever, but that's Close to neighbors. crazy. Privacy is part of the pursuit of happiness. And in the sardine can called Britain... They learn to get on with their neighbors. They have to. He's yeah. too damn close. <laughs> That's why they have so little crime in Britain. Believe it or not, even in wartime, the British cop does not carry a gun. Even back Nor then? Wow, that's amazing. Wow. And in 1926, when the world heard of this stoppage of work in Britain, that industry, transportation, the whole life of the country had been paralyzed by a general strike. It was still more surprised next day to learn that the strikers were playing football with the cops. No part of Britain is more than 100 miles from the sea. I heard it was 70, maybe it's 100. Every day for hundreds of years, years of peace and years of war, John Britton has seen ships sail from his island to the seven seas. That means that whenever John Britton wants to bust out of his sardine can, it's the sea that gets him. He's been busting out for hundreds of years. And that led to Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, Canada, and for that matter, the United States of America. How did John Britton Pretty down? crazy all these places come from this Remember one 1938? island originally. The won the pennant. Wrong way, Corrigan. The last trains ran on the 6th Avenue L. Well, John Britton got excited about the same sort of thing. The bet he had on the derby, or, as he would say, the derby. His job. His kids. Getting his exercise on his day off. Preston North End taking the football cup. Only 300 miles away, people were cheering another kind of event. 300 miles away. Wait. That's it? Wait, what? 300 miles away? What, is that right, guys? I mean, it must Cause, be. Cause he's talking, it's from the... He's talking about Germany. Uh-huh. Is that only 300 miles away? Huh? Wow. No wonder, no wonder you guys can get to Travel. places in Europe yeah. so much easier. Yeah. That's literally like going a state away. Like, right. yeah, like I've taken day trips of, of 300 <laughs> yeah. miles driving. Like, um, I mean, like I can't, like, I couldn't even get across North Carolina in 300 miles. No. It's like almost 500 miles. And the length of Indiana. Yeah, is is like, wow. That's, that's crazy. 300 miles? Is it really that close? It must be. Man, I did not know that. I mean, there's an ocean between. Yeah, right, but... But technically, you could drive now because of the Channel in Tunnel. In London and every other British city and town, they read about what was going on in Europe, and they got sore about it. But they were also pretty well determined to keep it none of their business. Then, this looked bad. The Czechs had a mutual assistance pact with France. And France had won with Britain. This might mean war, even though everyone was anxious to avoid it. They'd been through one war, perhaps been wounded. Hundreds of thousands of their brothers and friends had been killed. There was nothing beautiful to them about war, and they had no desire for another. In the last desperate effort to preserve peace, the Prime Minister today flew to Munich. All was well. Britain, France, Italy, and Germany were signing a pact at Munich. 
a pact in which the Germans agreed they had no further territorial claims to make. It was to be peace in our time. But it turned out to be a strange sort of peace. Hitler's first move was to break the pact he had signed. Wishful thinking was ended. Now they knew something had to be done about Germany. They approved the Conscription Act, the first peacetime conscription in British history. Oh, Just wow. as the Selective Service Act was the first in American history. Was that at the same time? Yeah. There's the masks, the gas masks. The British we have, we have a couple of those. They had in effect said to Hitler, That's enough. If you go into Poland, we'll fight. Hitler smiled. Like other would-be conquerors of Britain, Philip of Spain, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, he thought he understood the British. He didn't. The sleeping lion began to wake up. He was a pretty drowsy lion for the first six months of the war. He snapped and growled. more leaflets than bombs. He hoped that common sense would return to the German people. Oh, wow. And that they would throw out Hitler and the German warlords. And so I had no idea about that. They were dropping either. leaflets on the German people to get them to... And that, seems, and that, to me, seems like a very British thing to do. Yeah, it does, like, actually. Just a thinking. very even-keeled first move. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Stab. At dawn this morning, the German armies, without warning, invaded the neutral countries of Luxembourg, Holland, and Belgium. The king of the Belgians today surrendered his armies of more than half a million men. Pétain, as French chief of state, has asked for an armistice. The issue in France is ended. Britain was alone. Wouldn't that have been really cool? What? To have the radio be such a big part oh, of your radio. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, how it was back then. Yeah, I mean, all of your broadcast, all of your news. Basically. It's easier to get information now, mm -hmm. but it was such a simpler yeah. thing, and and there's something really beautiful about it's simplicity. It's nostalgic too, and I think yeah, I think it is. It's, yeah. it's very nostalgic. So, who were the troops going? Was that the British going into Germany just then? I didn't catch like that. It showed. It showed. No, I don't, I don't think it was. No. I didn't think it was either. Yeah, I don't think I didn't it was. Catch who it was. Oh. <laughs> Czechoslovakia occupied. Poland defeated. Oh, it Denmark was gone, the Germans. Norway okay. gone. Holland, wow. Belgium, France gone. Only Britain now. Britain was alone. Hitler considered the war over. Everybody considered the war over, except the British. At the 11th hour, the lion was finally aroused. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. For a year, they took everything that the Nazis could throw at them. For one solid year, from June 1940 to June of 1941, they were the only major power fighting the greatest war machine in the world. Wow. Wow. I didn't know you guys fought alone for that long. They took body blow after body blow. Solid punches before they even had their guard up. All they did was take it on the chin and hang on to the ropes. Mm. They never went down. Wow, look at him smiling. And while they buried their dead, they prepared grimly and defiantly for the day when they could strike back. Mm. Through all these long months, the British people were thinking and planning and working only for the day when they themselves could take the offensive. Wow. And that day came.
the British that made the Germans realize that war could be brought to German soil, too. Day after day, night after night. Wow, just a constant barrage. Wow. The offensive continues in greater and greater strength. That's in the air. And on the ground, 1,500 miles away in North Africa. This is a legit movie. Yeah, and it's who... a lot of footage. Yeah, who's filming all of this? And my question is, why are, aren't they in Africa right now? Like, Northern Africa? I think so. Why? Don't know. Let us know in the comments, guys. <laughs> Where can you? Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, how much have you, how much research have you done on World War II? Like none. Yeah, like I mean, I learned about World War II in school. Right. What they in the school. basics they teach. I've looked into it a little bit after that, but it's not something that I've really gone in depth on, which is. One of the reasons I really appreciate this film so far because it's given me a perspective, and mm -hmm. I think you as well, yeah, for sure. on this time period and what happened during World War II, to especially honest, from the British perspective. Yes, to be honest, I never even realized Britain was fighting alone in World War II for a period of time. Yeah, before. Yeah, I didn't either. Like against Germany, that part I, either I wasn't taught that, or I just you know I mean I yeah, wasn't it's one of the things aware just, enough at the time to right. really absorb, but. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's eye opening. Yeah, it really is. Seventeen hundred miles in one hundred and twenty two days. Seventeen hundred miles of sand and wind. Once more, the people of Britain heard their church bells ring. More than three years earlier, they had been warned that this would be the signal of invasion. But long since, the nightmare of the threat of invasion had passed. Now the bells rang out a song of thanksgiving, a song of victory. Mm. Now there is the plain and simple truth about Britain. But the fellow that calls the signals on the Axis team knows his only chance of winning is to split our team up. So his team plays a game at which they've had a lot of practice. A game which has conquered half a dozen countries for them. A game called Divide and Conquer. Men like these tell the British we aren't taking the war seriously. They tell the Russians we are letting them down. They tell the British the Russians will sell them out. And they tell us... It is manifestly ridiculous for the warmonger Roosevelt to tell the American people that they have anything in common with the British. On the contrary, they are different in every respect. Well, there are differences, that's true. Yeah, the propaganda. For instance, we drive on the right side of the road. So Still alive good. today. You're pretty drive left. We go for baseball. Yeah. They go for rugby? Is that what they're going to say? Cricket? Oh, with cricket, yeah. They because. a little number called cricket. Yeah, yeah, cricket. I thought they'd talk about... The, is the, was that the most popular sport at the time? I think they're just comparing... Yeah, I know, yeah. The... At first I thought they were saying the most popular sport. Billy Ben played side. <laughs> and anyone who ever drank coffee over there knows why there'll always be in England. Your coffee, all right, sir. <laughs> Give us 
glass of half and half. Have you heard about it, boys? Give us another glass of half and half. Blimey, you'd have thought it happened to poor old Bill. Another <laughs> bloke. <laughs> so I went into Sup Medella, but it's that in buckets and I was getting swatch. He loved that man. <laughs> and then Tchaikovsky's smaller piano fort works. I passed. Are they kidding, Jack? Why the cockamamie sprinkly from schmaltz mixed with celery tonic? Why do they all mush so much with corn cone in their mouth? You all can't understand what? a word. With what in their mouth? Yes, there corn are something. Corn? But there are a few things that Britain and America do have in common. A few? A lot. The important things of life. Okay. A little thing called a free representative government. We call it Congress. They call it Parliament. A little thing called freedom of speech. You know, in the next war, you've not got to go to it. They'll bring the war to you. And the thing is, if you take a tip from me, go and live at the Dorchester, because the trenches are just outside. This meeting is called on the orphans of the American Workers' Party, an organization dedicated to the organizing of the working class of America. Freedom of the press. Freedom of religion. They may not be important to Hitler. But all these things are the common heritage of John Q. Public and John Britton. 700 years ago, their ancestors fought for the Magna Carta. No one will we deny or delay. Something right else we need to do. Yes, very much so. 700 years ago, the petition of right. No man shall be compelled to yield any tax without act of parliament. The petition of right? Is that what he said? Oh, I don't know. I believe that's what he called it. I've never heard of that. The petition of right. All right, that's something I'm going to look up. These principles came to our own country with the earliest settlers, and from them developed. Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. We may make gags about each other's accents, but we speak the <laughs> same language of freedom. Even during the American Revolution, when we were at each other's throats, the Earl of Chatham was free to say about us to the British Parliament, You cannot but respect their cause and wish to make it your own. And that is why in the heart of London, alongside his great naval hero, Nelson, John Britton has put George Washington. I didn't know that. I didn't either. Parliament Square, the most sacred spot in the British Commonwealth of Nations, Abraham Lincoln. What? Of course, Hitler doesn't like this kind of talk. His job is to sell the British that we are a nation of money grubbers. They are different in every respect. And gangsters. While in the next studio, he is selling us the idea that the British are gutless and dopes. The John Q. Public and John Britton are entirely different. All right, Hitler. Where are these miners? Wales? or West Virginia. These farmers, mm. Devonshire yeah. or Wisconsin. Wow. These steel workers, Sheffield or Pittsburgh. These children, American or British, they live in lands which share the same hopes, the same ideals. And unlike the poor children of Germany, in lands where the truth is free. I, I literally couldn't tell. Well, I I couldn't for most of them, but the school one I kind of could because I think one of them the kids had uniforms. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Maybe, maybe. Although maybe changed. back then they might have still done uniforms. I know I they did I uniforms the back one, in the I day here. The first clip they didn't have uniforms, hmm. but maybe. But that's the only tell. Yeah. That's the only Man, that would be heavy. Oh, my goodness, yes. Britain is not the United States, and the United States is not Britain. For instance, we don't go in for this kind of thing. <laughs> they do. But there's no mystery about that. Remember our grandmother's house? It was old-fashioned, out of date, patched and altered to suit each new generation, and filled with family relics even grandmother couldn't explain. Well, John Britton has been living in his house for a long time. And that's why to us, who live in a modern house that we built ourselves to suit ourselves, John Breton seems slow-moving and cluttered up with ancient traditions. Kings, for instance. The present king rode to his coronation in the same coach, wow. to the same church, for the same ceremony as his ancestors did. 
but the job he took on is very different from theirs. There have been some changes made, for the British king can no longer make laws or impose taxes or interfere with government. He and his family work as hard as any other. Wait, hold on. Is that? Queen Elizabeth? No, is it? Hold on. So that is her, I believe. Yeah, that's her because she would have been the oldest. Her uncle abdicated the throne, it looks like, in 1936. Queen Elizabeth's dad uh, became king. Six? King in 1936 to 1952 when she became queen. Wow. So, so he was he served longer than I thought. Yeah, he did serve quite a bit, I guess. Um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly sure what year we're at they're talking about right now, but obviously sometime in the 40s, mm -hmm. early 40s. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Wow. All right. Another citizen doing the job that the people expect of them. Today, the king is the servant of the people and not its ruler. When an American is arrested and brought to trial, the bailiff calls his case. The people versus John Doe. But if such a case were called in Britain, it would be. The king versus John Doe. It means the same thing. Mm. Today, the British it king sounds is more the symbol scary, though. of the people. Yeah, <laughs> the British are great fans of the fellow in Buckingham Palace. But when they sing, God save the king, they're not worrying about his health. They mean, God bless the British people. Oh, oh yeah. I have never thought about it like yeah, that. I that makes it sense. literally. Right. But yeah, because the king, the king represents king represents the people, represents which I only people. recently found out. But yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Wow. Okay. Cool. And the dukes and the earls. But in 1911, the people took away the last remaining power of the lords to block the action of the people's representatives. Dukes and earls don't run the country anymore. Today, there are only two people who do that. John Britton <laughs> and his wife. <laughs> Have you on the wire. Be the other yeah. way around. <laughs> Just as Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Public do here and elect their representatives to the House of Commons. And there they fix the taxes and make the laws. And if John wanted to get rid of the Lords, his representatives in Commons can at any time vote them out of existence. But John doesn't want to get rid of them. So he confuses us by keeping dukes and lords in a country where <laughs> unions have long been accepted as an essential part of the democratic system, where the Labour Party, controlled by the unions, is one of the two great political parties, where longshoremen and railroad engineers have been ministers of the crown, and where for 30 years he has had a system of social security even more extensive than our own. 30 years? So when you read about Lord Lewis Mountbatten or Lord Beaverbrook, former head of aircraft production, don't think they got their jobs because of their titles. They got them because they were the best men for the jobs. Just as Ernest Bevan, formerly a labor leader and now a member of the War Cabinet, Herbert Morrison, who started life as an errand boy and is now a Minister of Home Security, got their important jobs because they were the best men for them. With the things on the surface, the unimportant things, their John Britton and our John Q. Public differ. But the important part of their lives, they run the same way. The democratic way. The free way. All right, guys. Um, I think that, yeah, that's a good place to stop on uh, the video today. Yeah. I'm really glad that I'm watching this from the lens of knowing more about the UK now. Yes. Because yes. if I had watched this... You'd be so lost. I would, I would. And I have a lot more understanding, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And I just get you guys more after watching this. And I... We really are cousins. Um, yeah. And I, I think, for the most part, no matter where you live in the world, humans all have the same fundamental desires desires dreams. and yeah and i just but some countries are more intertwined right, and alike than others america and, and britain the uk yeah mm -hmm. yeah absolutely beautiful yeah. i love it me too and i think now more so than back then we get each other more I think so. Because I think social media has helped. I was going to say, the internet has definitely yeah, helped uh, it, expand that. We're a little more 
I mean, even us, yeah. like, like you imagine without the internet, without YouTube specifically, like I would know so much less about the UK than mm -hmm. I do now. And it would feel similar to the, not quite the same because obviously some of the beliefs are outdated, but, right. but it would be like the more stereotypical type of beliefs. Whereas once you get to know someone more, you... Figure yep. out you're much more like right exactly yeah. exactly guys um yeah I think that's it for us today um we are going to uh, have part two up tomorrow mm -hmm. so um please uh, check in for that and yeah. and really look forward to continuing this um, this has been a really big eye opener mm -hmm. on what life must have been like. For, um, and how tough you guys are. In the world. Absolutely. Knowing you guys fought for a really long time by yourselves. Yeah. I just never knew that. Yeah. You know, Brings like. Tears to my eyes. Actually, yeah. So. I think that's it for us today, guys. Thank you so much for stopping by. Please click that like button. Feel free to drop your comments, suggestions about this video or others. And don't forget to subscribe. And also join us tomorrow for part two of Know Your Ally Britain. Till next time, guys. Peace. Bye.